This episode is dedicated to the memory of Jacqueline Zeman. Sixteen-year-old Kathy Malton was excited for the end of the school day on September 24, 1971. Rushing home, she asked her father if he could give her a ride into town for supplies. There was a dance that night, and the teen was planning to attend, but she needed to finish the hem of her dress. Her father watched as she climbed out of his car and walked towards the store, never imagining that that would be the last time he would ever see her. Desperate to find their eldest daughter, the Moultons were hit with a series of roadblocks. Most notable was that the Portland Police Department tried to convince them that she was a runaway and would return in her own time. Resentfully, they accepted a missing persons report, but no solid investigation was conducted, and it wouldn't be until decades later that new detectives would take on the case with all of its twists and turns. Working from behind the eight ball, Throughout the 1990s, detectives managed to unlock more information that eventually led them north of Portland and across the border into Canada. They learned about the last days of Kathy's life, where she had been taken and by whom. They also quickly discovered that, had police initially taken the case seriously, they might have been able to bring the teenager home, alive. Instead, the disappearance of Kathy Moulton not only remains open, but is the oldest missing persons case in the state of Maine. However, there is one thing which is known for certain. There are people out there who know exactly what happened to Kathy Moulton, but even more than a half a century later, they refuse to speak up. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 237, The Disappearance of Kathy Moulton. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we dig into the disturbing 1971 disappearance of Kathy Moulton. Before jumping into the case, just a quick reminder that I will once again be representing Trace Evidence on Podcast Row at CrimeCon this year. CrimeCon takes place in Nashville, Tennessee on the weekend of May 31st through June 2nd. As always, I'm excited to meet and chat with all of you there. So if you're planning to attend and you haven't yet purchased your pass, use promo code TRACE to save 10%. That's CrimeCon.com promo code TRACE. I'm really looking forward to seeing you there. When 16-year-old Kathy Moulton vanished from the streets of Portland, her family pleaded for assistance from local police, but instead they were ignored and laughed at. More than 50 years later, The truth of what became of their daughter remains concealed. This is episode 237, The Disappearance of Kathy Moulton. Maine is the most deeply and extensively forested state in the country and houses the largest contiguous block of undeveloped forest land east of the Mississippi. The vast majority of residents live in the southern half of the state, where cities such as Bangor, Lewiston, and Portland thrive and continue to grow. The further north one travels, the thinner the population becomes, and large cities transform into small towns and they transform in turn to tiny outposts until all signs of the modern world are lost within the beautiful and vast, almost endless stretch of thick, untouched forestry. The forests of Maine are so extensive, in fact, that despite more than 200 years worth of harvesting them for wood, the state maintains the highest ratio of forested lands, with more than 90% of Maine being forest. This includes some 12 million acres in the northern part of the state, where hardly anyone lives. For the sake of comparison, the entire state of Massachusetts is but 6.7 million acres. As one would expect, there are areas of this forested land that have been vastly explored, but this represents only a small sliver of the wooded land, much of it so deep and untouched that even the most experienced of hunters can easily find themselves lost and without any indication of where to turn. According to the Maine Warden Service, there are, on average, 418 calls annually for search and rescue to locate and save people who have become lost or injured. Suffice it to say, 
There are large areas within these forests which have never been mapped, let alone deeply explored, and some areas have likely not felt the compression of human footprints in hundreds of years. As one might expect, the sheer depth and breadth of the forest has resulted in countless stories, myths, and legend about lost civilizations, cryptids, and other phenomena that tease the mind and capture the imagination. Many have wondered what secrets might lie deep within the forest, tangled up between the mix of deciduous and evergreen trees. Some have gone to find those answers, and while many eventually turned back, others were never seen again, lost somewhere in an area where it's incredibly difficult to track anyone. While some seek to illuminate the unknown, others thrive upon its ability to keep a secret. The deeper and darker, the better. In fact, if one were to know the right area, if they could find the correct pathway, they might come upon clues or perhaps even the answer to a mystery which has haunted a family and the entire state for more than five decades. That being the fate of a 16-year-old girl who went out shopping one fall afternoon in 1971 and never made it home. Kathy Marie Moulton was born on Tuesday, June 28, 1955 in Portland, Cumberland County, Maine, to parents Claire and Lyman Moulton. Kathy was the Moulton's firstborn child and would be the eldest sibling amongst three daughters, as Kimberly and Pamela would follow. Lyman, or Roy as he was more frequently known, was the owner and proprietor of Roy Moulton's used cars, while Claire, prior to the arrival of the children, had worked as an ER nurse, but eventually decided to stay home and commit herself to raising their three girls. Kathy would be raised alongside her sisters in a white clapboard house located at 102 Clinton Street in northwest Portland, less than a mile east of Deering High School. Friends and family have described Kathy as quiet and thoughtful, caring, and intelligent. She was a good student, loved to laugh and dance, and had strong desires to help others. She was often known to spend hours chatting with lonely elderly neighbors or offering up her services as a babysitter to others. Her mother, Claire, later explained, quote, She seemed to be interested in helping people. She was down the street all the time sitting with a friend of the family who was paralyzed. It was amazing how well they could communicate considering he had a speech impairment. She felt if you were nice to other people, they would be nice to you. End quote. Kathy was described as having several close friends, and when her time wasn't spent taking care of others or attending school, she loved attending dances held by the local 7-Eleven club in the YWCA. Swing was her preference, but she danced regardless of the theme. Not only did she frequently attend these dances, but she often made her own dresses and outfits and showed a talent and flair for both the design and manufacture of clothing, a skill she had learned from her mother. Kathy's talents, however, were not limited to this realm, as much like her father and siblings, she had a gift for writing, poetry specifically. This was a love and passion she would continue throughout her life, and when she was exposed to the influence of modern poets and beatniks through a teacher, one her father described as in tune with the hippie generation, she was drawn into the world of creative expression by way of the written and spoken word. Growing into her teens, Kathy would often attend poetry readings at the Gate Coffee House, located less than three miles from her home at 654 Congress Street near Longfellow Square. When she had an afternoon free, the young woman would drop in to listen, be inspired, or just hang out with friends who shared similar interests. Opened in November of 1965, the Gate advertised itself as featuring pop art, poetry, and guitars. It would become a landmark in the area as much of Portland's youth would find their way in, making friends and hanging out in a space one article described as, quote, likely to prove real cool for coffeehouse addicts. Outside of dances and poetry, Kathy was close with her parents and siblings, pitching in to help when it was necessary and looking after her sisters as time might demand. According to her sister Kim, Kathy was a caring and older sister with whom she could share anything and often did, under what they playfully referred to as sister secrets. Arriving home from school, the team would often flop down beside her mother, and they would talk for hours about life, school, and everything in between. While Kathy was well-behaved, didn't cause many problems for her parents, 
as she grew older, she started to express a little more of her rebellious side. She started wearing more makeup, despite complaints from her folks. She'd sneak cigarettes here and there, and she kept secrets about who she was spending time with when she went out to the coffee house. She and a friend caught the eye of a local photographer and posed for portraits in his studio, something her parents weren't all that thrilled to learn. While the coffee house was home to a lot of teenagers with whom Kathy either attended school or knew through friends and acquaintances, at 15, she started drawing attention from an older crowd. College aged and sometimes older men would flirt with the teenager, often shocked to learn her real age, but as is always the case, there were those who found that more appealing for whatever their twisted interests might have been. Kathy, through the aid of friends and her own powerful expression, managed to wade through the minefield and refused to allow the behaviors of others to impact where she felt comfortable going. Following the last days of school in the summer of 1971, Kathy's parents planned a major road trip vacation for the whole family. Loading all the kids up into a new, big Cadillac, the Moultons set off on an 81-day adventure, which would take them around the United States and down into parts of Mexico. Kathy kept a detailed journal discussing the trip, which involved seeing as much of the country as they could and stopping to stay at roadside motels along the way. According to her younger sister, Kim, it was a fun and exciting trip, and she felt the whole family grew a little bit closer during that time. On Monday, June 28th, the family celebrated Kathy's 16th birthday in Williamsburg, Virginia. They shared a pizza and cut pieces of a delicious cake for the celebration, where Kathy's parents explained that, as they continued on the trip, should she see anything she wanted as a birthday gift, they'd make sure to get it for her. When the family later arrived in Texas, Kathy was drawn to a Mexican-made, tan and brown, reversible, tooled leather handbag, and her parents kept their word, purchasing it as a belated birthday gift. Kathy loved the bag and would carry it with her everywhere, including on the day she was last seen. The Moultons returned home that summer just two days before the start of school, and according to both friends and family, Kathy had enjoyed the family vacation and was excited to get back into the swing of school and hanging with her friends. That year, she'd be a junior at Deering High School, and she was looking forward to what the world might have to offer. Nancy Barlow, Kathy's then best friend, would later explain that she'd never seen Kathy happier than she had seen her that September. Tragically, the 16-year-old would mysteriously disappear just a few weeks into the school year before she could even get a month into her junior year. The nightmare would begin on Friday, September 24th. The Friday began normally and without any indication of what would happen later. After getting ready and enjoying breakfast, Kathy headed off for school. Being Friday, the 16-year-old was excited to finish up for the day, but it was really the night that she was looking forward to. There was a 7-Eleven club dance that night, and Kathy had been working on putting the finishing touches on a pants skirt she'd put together for it. Her afternoon ended with a study hall, and upon exiting the school, she made the quick half-mile walk back to the family home on Clinton Street. Rushing inside, she asked her father if he could give her a ride into town so she could pick up some last-minute supplies. She had a run in the pantyhose she'd planned to wear to the dance and needed a new pair. She also needed some thread to finish up the hem of the pants skirt. Hearing of her plans to go to the store, Kathy's mother, Claire, handed her some money and asked if she could also pick up toothpaste because they were running low. In addition to money for that purchase, Claire gave Kathy change so she could take the bus home, something she had done many times before. In total, it was stated that Kathy had no more than $3 in her favorite birthday gift handbag when she left the family home that afternoon. Roy would later state that he dropped Kathy off in front of the old New England Telephone and Telegraph office at the corner of Cumberland and Forest Avenue at approximately 1.15 p.m. Other articles would report this time being closer to 4.15 p.m., and there doesn't seem to be any specificity. This intersection is located approximately two and a half miles southeast from their home, and according to Roy, he kissed his daughter and told her that he'd see her at home for dinner that night he proceeded on towards his used car lot on Forest Avenue and would later state that Kathy exited the vehicle onto Cumberland Avenue and then turned south, heading towards Congress Street 
which runs parallel to Cumberland, one block south. She was on her way to the former Porteous Mitchell and Braun store at 522 Congress, less than two-tenths of a mile from where her father had dropped her off. Roy watched for a moment and then turned his attention back to the road, driving off without ever imagining that that would be the last time he'd ever see his firstborn child. Over the course of the next few hours, no one had any idea that anything had gone wrong, nor did they have anything to indicate that they should be worried. It wouldn't be until 6 p.m. that Kathy's absence was reported with a note of concern. The Moultons always sat down for dinner together at 6 sharp, and when Kathy didn't arrive in time, her parents were both annoyed and somewhat worried. It wasn't like Kathy to be late, especially without first calling to explain why. 30 minutes later, when Kathy still hadn't shown up and hadn't called, Roy decided something had to be wrong. He picked up the phone and placed calls to Portland's three hospitals, wondering if his daughter had been involved in some kind of an accident, but none of the hospitals had any record of her being admitted. Next, the family started calling around to all of Kathy's friends, but none of them had any idea where she might be either. As Claire continued making calls, Roy climbed into his car. The sun had begun setting moments earlier, and he headed towards downtown, watching as streetlights and storefronts began to glow beneath the approach of dusk. In addition to the evening growing darker, temperatures had begun dropping from the low 60s to the low 50s, and he knew Kathy wasn't properly dressed for the chill. Arriving downtown, Roy drove around the areas he knew his daughter was familiar with. He passed slowly by side streets, staring down them intently, seeking any sign of Kathy. He stopped next to groups of children and then asked if they'd seen his daughter, describing her appearance and what she had been wearing, but again, no one had seen her. Finally, Roy and Claire decided they needed to get the authorities involved. Claire would later explain to Portland Monthly that she called the Portland Police Department and, after explaining the situation, the officer on the other end of the line laughed at her, suggesting that a teenager being 30 minutes late was hardly an emergency situation. The officer then explained that the family would need to wait 72 hours before reporting Kathy missing. Angry with this, Roy drove down to the station himself and argued with the desk sergeant, who Roy would later describe as needlessly difficult and condescending. Finally, when Roy refused to accept no for an answer, he was allowed to fill out a missing persons report, though he was very much under the impression the police did this only to shut him up and get him to leave. It wasn't as though they suddenly were taking the situation seriously. For more than the next decade, this slim little report would be the only paperwork added to Kathy's missing persons file. Roy spent hours searching for his daughter that night, since there didn't appear to be any police officers jumping in to help. The next morning, he returned to speak with the Portland police who finally agreed to send out a be-on-the-lookout report to all of their cruisers and to notify the Maine State Police of the missing persons report. Still, though, they tried to convince the family that Kathy had likely gotten together with friends and chose not to come home, or worse yet, that she might have elected to run away. Aside from the fact that at the time, the Portland Police Department had absolutely none of its budget allocated towards missing persons investigations, they had seen a large amount of teenagers running away from home throughout the previous years, with that number being totaled at 200 runaways each year. According to multiple reports at the time, it appears that the Portland Police did the bare minimum. They took the report, interviewed the family, and spoke with some of Kathy's friends. They then placed her file into a large cabinet, which was filled with hundreds of similar cases that hadn't been followed up on and likely never would be. Despite the family's urgent insistence that Kathy wasn't a runaway, their pleas fell on deaf ears. The 16-year-old had been excited for the dance, but had never arrived. She'd left behind all of her clothing, her poetry, her makeup, and the money she had saved from babysitting. It didn't make sense that she would have run away. Not one of her friends felt there was anything to suggest she would have ever run away, and according to everyone who had seen her that Friday, she was super excited for the dance and said she wouldn't have missed it for the world. Sadly, as is too often the case, Kathy's parents found out that if they wanted anything to be done, they were going to have to make it happen themselves. 
the Portland police wouldn't even do so much as contact the papers to run her photo or a small article about her disappearance. They were utterly useless, and their choice not to assist a desperate family would later be reported to very likely be one of the key reasons that Kathy never made it home. Her sister Kim would later explain, saying, quote, The attitudes of the era was that she was probably just rebelling or protesting or ran off with her boyfriend if he had gotten drafted. It was not taken with the seriousness that it was to our family. End quote. Ultimately, it was determined that Kathy did make it to the store that day and purchased the items she needed. Sometime after 5 p.m., the teenager arrived at Starbird Music, located at 525 Forest Avenue, placing her just over a mile north from where her father dropped her earlier. The music store, owned by the family of a friend, was just eight-tenths of a mile southeast from Kathy's home. Carol Starbird, who worked at her family's business, chatted with Kathy for a short period of time after her arrival. Carol would later report that Kathy explained she had spent the money her mother had given her for bus fare and was in a rush to get home so she could shower and get ready for the dance that night. According to Carol, Kathy left at approximately 5.30 p.m., continuing north along Forest Avenue. Today, that is a distance which Google Maps stipulates would take no more than 20 minutes to walk, meaning that unless something had gone wrong, Kathy should have arrived home between 5.50 and her family's 6 p.m. dinner time. For the most part, this is where the initial investigation, at least from the perspective of law enforcement, mostly came to a conclusion. Desperate for help, the family turned to the local community and begged newspapers to cover the story. On Tuesday, October 5th, 11 days after Kathy was reported missing, local papers touched on the story, but barely. The Portland Press Herald and the Evening Express printed statements from the Moltons asking for anyone with information on their daughter's whereabouts to contact them or police. These statements were published beneath a photo of the missing girl. The so called articles were no more than three sentences apiece. Five days later, on Sunday, October 10th, the Maine Sunday Telegram ran an article entitled Police Hunt in Vain for Missing Girls. The article addressed both Kathy's disappearance as well as that of 11-year-old Barbara Ann Ripley and how there didn't appear to be any clues or information to what might have happened. Tragically, Barbara's body would be found in a box in a barn a decade later leaving many more questions than answers have ever been provided. Speaking to the Telegram, then Youth Aid Bureau Officer Russell Norris stated that the search for Kathy was, quote, at a standstill. We've checked out every clue, but nothing. We just don't know what happened. She just dropped from sight, end quote. Hoping to get more assistance with their search and to increase awareness of the case, the Moltons reached out to the director of Portland's FBI office. At the time, the director explained that the Bureau did not have jurisdiction to get involved and couldn't open an investigation without solid evidence of abduction. But he did manage to convince the producers of the popular television series FBI to show Kathy's photo at the end of several episodes. It was certainly more than the local police had done, and the Moltons hoped that someone somewhere might recognize Kathy. Unfortunately, This move did little to illuminate the mystery, and the Moltons found themselves back to square one, trying to balance raising their two daughters with running their own investigations into Kathy's disappearance. Tips came in, but they almost always were too vague to rely upon, or they led to solid dead ends. There were rumors circulating at Deering High School that Kathy had run off south to Boston, but it was little more than the debate and speculation you'd expect to hear among high school students. Alvin Drake, who was often Kathy's dance partner, reported the general talk of the time said she had probably gone to Boston, while Kathy's best friend, Nancy Barlow, stated that when a friend in study hall had talked about visiting Boston, Kathy had, quote, appeared interested. These are the leads the family was trying to track down. Two months later, in early November, while cleaning out Kathy's locker, school officials discovered a torn piece of paper with a phone number scrawled on it. Assuming it might lead to potential clues, police called the number 
and reported that it ended up ringing one of the phones at her father's used car dealership. In desperation, Roy accepted the assistance of Alex Tannis, a man famous throughout New England for his alleged psychic powers. Together, the two drove around Portland until Alex claimed to have felt vibrations, telling him that Kathy had climbed into a car and the car had continued down Forest Avenue. He thought the vehicle might have turned left at either Coyle or Lincoln Streets, respectively 584 and 827 feet north of Starbird Music. He then lost his vibrations. Of course, he couldn't figure out which street it was or where they had gone beyond that. Expressing his tremendous psychic abilities, he also failed to determine the make, model, or color of the vehicle. He could not give a description of the driver, He could not say if anyone else was in the car. He couldn't say if Kathy had been forced or if she had got in willingly. You know, I'm always amazed by how these psychics are only able to provide vague details, almost as if their entire profession is a lie and they're little more than vultures preying on those who have suffered great tragedies. But I digress. Not long after Thanksgiving that year, a holiday which had felt empty and painful for the Moulton family, they finally received some information that fed their desperate hope of bringing Kathy home. The Maine State Police contacted the family and notified them that they had received information that a young woman, fitting Kathy's description, was known to be living in the area of Presque Isle, nearly 300 miles northeast of Portland and not far from the Canadian border. The tip had apparently come in from an employee at a local gas station. As soon as they were informed, Roy and Claire decided to make the drive north and to hopefully find their daughter. Sadly, upon arriving in Presque Isle, they quickly realized that law enforcement had once again failed them. Speaking to officials at the local sheriff's department, they were informed that not only did investigators know nothing of Kathy's disappearance, they were also unaware of the alleged sighting. As was often the case back in the day, and even still to this day, Different jurisdictions were simply not communicating with one another. Roy managed to organize a meeting with local police and sheriff's deputies during which time he broke down the case of his missing daughter and passed out photos of the 16-year-old along with a detailed description. Seeing that Presque Isle law enforcement had reacted with much the same nonchalance as the Portland police had, Roy and Claire once again took it upon themselves to try and spread the word and track down their daughter. They took their flyers and went to town, going store to store and putting up flyers on doors and in windows, on light poles and street corners. When they felt they'd covered the area, they moved outwards towards the residents of the town, going door to door and asking if they had seen Kathy and whether or not they'd be willing to take some flyers and spread them around. They even went so far as to cross the border into Canada, putting up flyers and speaking to residents of New Brunswick. Sadly, While they were doing everything in their power to try and find Kathy, the girl who had initially been reported as possibly being the missing 16-year-old returned home. She had run away from Connecticut, and while she was happily reunited with her family, there didn't appear to be any trace of Kathy outside of some local rumors. There was a story going around about a young woman who had been taken up with a native, crossed the border, and was living on the Tobik First Nation just north of Perth Andover in New Brunswick. The family followed up on these rumors, but they never found anything solid to convince them that it was Kathy, or whether or not it was true at all. Heartbroken, and without any new information to assist their searches, the Moultons returned south to Portland. Left behind in Kathy's bedroom were all of her belongings, including the outfit she'd planned to finish hemming and wear to the dance the night she vanished. Since the Moultons were in possession of Kathy's social security card, they thought that might be a method by which they could track down their daughter if she had run away, or perhaps identify someone else using her number. The couple reached out to Senator Margaret Chase Smith and asked her if it would be possible for them to be notified should anyone out there attempt to use their daughter's social security number. To their surprise, they were informed that that could not be done. If Kathy had run away, it would violate her privacy. The best that could be done was that the Moultons were asked to write a letter, and the senator assured them that should someone use Kathy's social security number, that person would be given a copy of the letter. 
they were flabbergasted that they weren't even allowed to try and track their missing daughter. Asked about this, Roy vented his frustration, saying, quote, I understand families fight and so on, but when there is a legitimate reason someone should know, that's what gets me. A person is an important thing. You are, I am, and Kathy is. If the government wanted to, they'd turn hell and high water over to locate somebody just not paying their taxes. But when it comes to missing persons, the doors are closed. We just want to know what happened to our daughter. End quote. The Moultons continued doing everything they could to try and find their daughter. They spoke to the police often, did interviews for local papers, and hired private investigators, but they couldn't seem to get anywhere. Meanwhile, investigators had allowed Kathy's case to fall by the wayside. 1971 would come to a conclusion without any new developments or advances in the case, and in fact, so would 72, and 73, and so on. There wouldn't be any new information or movement on Kathy's case for more than 12 years, when a hunter would relay a disturbing experience to local investigators. It was the fall of 1983, and the Moultons had been searching for their daughter for more than a decade. The 16-year-old who'd gone missing from the streets of Portland would, by that point, have been 28 years old. She'd been missing for nearly as long as the family were lucky enough to have been graced by her presence. While they maintained hope that someday their daughter would return home, the passage of more than a decade had truly put their faith to the test. However, they continued to search for Kathy, lived in the same home, and refused to change their phone number on the off chance that she might reach out. Then, one day, a hunter walked out of the woods in Smyrna, a small town in Aroostook County, approximately 60 miles south from Presque Isle, where the Moultons had previously pursued alleged sightings of a girl matching Kathy's description. The hunter contacted authorities and explained that, while deep within the forest, he had come upon skeletal remains. He theorized the remains had belonged to a female, as he reported the body was surrounded by women's clothing and that the skeleton still wore the shredded remnants of a bra across its exposed ribcage. Asked if he could describe the area, the hunter stated that the body, which he added was intact other than the skull, which seemed to be missing, had been found in an area close to a triangular-shaped pile made up of six empty maple syrup barrels. The barrels, he reported, were in close proximity to an old stove. The area the hunter described actually made sense to the main warden service, as that area of the woods had been home to many maple sugar camps throughout the 1970s. The hunter told police that he thought he'd be able to lead them back to that location, and so they set forth on an expedition to find the body. Unfortunately, due to the density of the forest and the great expanse it covered, the hunter was unable to retrace his steps. Investigators reached out to locals who knew the forest well, and many of them confirmed a familiarity with the site described by the hunter, but the police were never able to locate it. As a result, the hunter's tip was filed away, but nothing more was done at the time. With the passage of time and the half-assed investigation that had been conducted into Kathy's disappearance, no one in law enforcement even made the connection that the remains might be Kathy. It wouldn't be until two decades later that investigators began to analyze that possibility. From this point forward, Kathy's disappearance will pop up on the radar of law enforcement multiple times, and there will be these little stutter steps, start and stop investigations. The next time anyone in the Portland Police Department examined Kathy's case, would be five years after the hunter had come forward, in 1988, 17 years after the 16-year-old was last seen alive as she hopped down the steps of Starbird Music less than a mile from the Clinton Street home she never got back to. It was New Year's Day when Detective William Deachin stumbled across Kathy's missing persons case file in a cabinet jammed full of similar cases that had never been truly followed up on. Opening the folder, he came upon case number 60-141, but there was little information inside of the file to offer up any helpful answers. Inside, he found just one sheet of paper, the missing persons report the Moultons had filed back in 1971. 
Deachin asked around the office and found an older officer who recalled showing a photograph of a missing woman to the family to ask if it resembled their daughter. A father of four daughters himself, Deachin decided to reopen the case and to see what answers he might be able to find for the family. Looking over the information presented and speaking to former investigators, he was overwhelmed by the sense that his predecessors had dramatically failed the Moltons, and he wanted to try and make up for their callous carelessness. Detective Deachin made the short three-mile drive from the department to the old clapboard house on Clinton Street. He climbed the five steps up onto the front porch and knocked on the door, which was opened by Roy. Deachin introduced himself and had to ask what was likely one of the most difficult questions of his career. Had Kathy ever been found, or had she returned home? The Moltons were shocked, informing the detective that this was the first time anyone with the Portland Police Department had followed up with them over the previous 17 years. Roy and Claire explained that Kathy had never returned home, and they felt that the police had abandoned them and long forgotten about their plight. Deachin did the best he could to apologize for how the case had been handled, and while acknowledging that it might be too little too late, he wanted to try and find some answers. The Moltons invited Deachin in and explained the case to him, going over all of the known information in painstaking detail. They discussed the last day they had seen Kathy, their trip up north to try and track down sightings, the private investigators they'd cycled through, the rumors, the vibrations of a psychic, and everything they had kept in an accounting of for nearly two decades. Deachin asked if the Moltons were still in possession of Kathy's belongings, and they walked him to her bedroom, opening the door to reveal a space frozen in time. They had kept Kathy's room exactly as it had been left that Friday in 1971. Deachin went through the room, was allowed to read through Kathy's journal and all of her poetry in search of potential tips or clues. During the course of his investigation, Deachin spoke with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, at which time he was informed that they were in possession of an unidentified body of a young murder victim who had been found in Surrey, British Columbia. While that placed the body on the other side of the continent, more than 3,000 miles west from Maine, Deachin decided to ask the Moltons for copies of Kathy's dental records so that a comparison could be drawn up. While he wasn't sure there would be a match, he figured at least they could eliminate the possibility, and when the records were compared, that's exactly what happened, as the medical examiner stated the unidentified woman was definitely not Kathy Moulton. Kathy has a very distinct dental profile, as she had two eye teeth, or canines as they're commonly called, removed before she had gotten braces. It had been a dead end and a fruitless pursuit, but it had also been the first major investigative work done on the missing teens case in nearly 20 years. The Moltons were grateful that anything was being done and Deachin grew close to the family, overwhelmed by a feeling that he and his department owed it to them to make sure something more was done. Roy would later comment about how impactful Deachin's actions had been, telling Portland Magazine, quote, you don't know how important it is to have anyone try to do something after all these years. It's more than we ever hoped would happen, end quote. Unfortunately, Deachin's investigation quickly grew cold, but he did manage to get the case some attention in the media and had added his own notes and reports to the paltry case file. His work would become the basis for a much more thorough investigation, but once again, it wouldn't come quickly. In fact, after January of 1988, it wouldn't be until the mid-90s that another detective picked up where Deachin had left off. Seven years later, in 1995, 24 years after Kathy went missing, newly promoted Portland Police Detective Kevin Cady is handed a file by his boss, Sergeant Thomas Joyce. Flipping the folder open, Cady finds only two documents inside, the original missing persons report dated September 25, 1971, and Detective William Deachin's investigative supplement dated January 15, 1988, the last time any work was logged on the case. Sergeant Joyce asked Katie to see what he could figure out, and for reasons he couldn't fully understand, Katie was drawn into the case. He would later explain, quote, Joyce and I wanted to find an answer for this family who had been waiting so long. We felt the Portland police had let them down years and years ago. 
It was our mission to give them an answer about what happened. She didn't just disappear from Forest Avenue into thin air. Something happened to her. End quote. Detective Katie decided that the best way to handle the case was to behave as though it was brand new and to start from square one, which, given the lack of an original investigation, isn't all that far from the truth. He wanted to speak with those who were close to Kathy in 71, and the first person he managed to track down was Nancy Barlow, the missing teen's best friend. In discussions with Barlow, he learned about an older man who was allegedly spending a lot of time with the teen around the time of her disappearance. He was also put into contact with Chris Church, the photographer whose studio Kathy had attended for portraits. Separately, both of them named the man who had been hanging around as Lester Everett, 22 years old in 1971, and he is furthermore identified by Barlow as Kathy's older boyfriend. Katie was then put into contact with a man who, back in 1971, was local to Portland and was friends with Lester Everett. This witness told Katie that on the day of her disappearance, Lester picked up Kathy as she was walking home and had also picked up another male. According to the witness, he never saw Lester Everett in town after that fateful Friday. Working off this information, Katie came upon other witnesses who were able to independently confirm the story. Reportedly, these witnesses told Katie that they saw Kathy getting into a blue car along with Lester Everett and an unknown man. Katie later learned that the other man in the car was a Canadian national who lived on the Tobik Reservation outside of Perth Andover in New Brunswick, 300 miles north of Portland. Allegedly, Everett agreed to give this guy a ride home that Friday, and while Kathy had gotten into the car, Katie does not believe she was made aware of the plan until it was already too late. Digging into Lester Everett, Katie learned some disturbing details about the weekend Kathy went missing. A woman, identified only as Miss Davis, contacted the police to report the theft of her vehicle. She was the owner of the Davis Motel in Falmouth, a small town eight miles north of Portland, and she stated that a former employee of the motel, Lester Everett, stole her blue four-door 1963 Cadillac just prior to Kathy's disappearance. Included in the police report was a note that Miss Davis's credit card was inside of the Cadillac when it was taken, and a month later, she had received a bill showing that her card had been used in Fort Fairfield, 288 miles north from Falmouth and just 10 miles northeast of Presque Isle, where there had been stories about a young girl matching Kathy's description being taken to a reservation in the area, a tip the Moultons had tried to track down on their own 24 years earlier. An examination of the credit bill showed that the person using Miss Davis's card, presumed to be Lester Everett, had stopped at Dorsey's Garage, at which time they purchased four brand new tires for the 1963 Cadillac. Don Logan, an employee of the garage, was able to tell police specific details about that day as he was present and remembered it well. According to Logan, the vehicle was occupied by three people two men, and a younger woman who he identified as Kathy. Logan explained that he remembered the encounter so well because it had left a disturbing impression on him. According to Logan, the woman believed to be Kathy didn't appear happy to be there, and the unknown man traveling with her and Everett seemed to have a strange control over her. Logan noted that when Kathy got out of the car to go to the bathroom, the unknown man placed his hand on the back of her neck and walked her to the door. He then waited outside, and when she exited, he placed his hand on the back of her neck again and walked her back to the car. Logan felt the man was controlling Kathy, perhaps in an attempt to stop her from leaving. For the first time in more than two decades, there was an active investigation into Kathy's disappearance, and it was bearing fruit left and right. While Detective Katie felt excited to be breaking things open, he couldn't help but wonder how many answers might have been found in 1971 if only the Portland Police Department had actually chosen to give the case an investigation. Multiple people who had lived on the reservation in 1971 confirmed to Katie 
that they remember both Kathy and Everett being there over the course of a few days that September. Reportedly, after being on the reservation, they had traveled to the Mars Hill area, 15 miles southeast of Presque Isle. There, they would proceed on to McBride's farm to harvest potatoes. Detective Katie managed to track down and speak with a woman named Millie Augustine, who stated that she had been working the potato harvest in Mars Hill that year, and she distinctly remembered Kathy Moulton. Augustine was around Kathy's age at the time, and the two struck up a friendship, although Augustine told investigators that Kathy was using a fake name at the time, being referred to as Candy. According to Augustine, Kathy didn't seem happy to be there, appeared frightened of the men working the farm, frequently broke down crying, and was often heard pleading that she just wanted to go home. While the others worked the fields and socialized, Kathy apparently spent the vast majority of her time sitting in the backseat of the Cadillac, and others present at the farm were so concerned about her that they would frequently check in. Augustine's father used to make dinner for Kathy, which he hand-delivered to her in the backseat of that car. Augustine went on to note that Kathy had disappeared just as rapidly as she had arrived. One night, Everett told the group that he and Kathy were going to take a short drive around and would later return. Everett came back the next morning, alone. And when Augustine questioned him about Kathy's whereabouts, he allegedly replied that he had brought her back to the Tobik Reservation and left a 16-year-old with the other person he had traveled north with. This story would change slightly over time, as other people at the harvest also had questions, and Everett would state that he had dropped Kathy off at another camp where they were also harvesting. Katie continued digging into the case. The deeper he went, the more information he found. It was almost as if these witnesses had been waiting decades for someone, anyone, to come and ask them about this bizarre series of events. According to what Detective Katie was able to learn, it is believed that on the night of Wednesday, September 29, 1971, five days after Kathy was reported missing, Lester Everett drove her back across the Canadian border into New Brunswick. Allegedly, he utilized a dirt road that allowed him to bypass custom inspections points, a pathway allegedly shown to him by the Canadian man he'd given a ride to. At approximately 10 p.m., Everett took Kathy across the border and pulled on to the Tobik Reservation. Here, Everett apparently convinced the Canadian man to take Kathy from him, and after an hour, he drove off the reservation alone. When later asked about why he had done this, Everett told at least one person that he had been glad to get rid of, quote, that nagging bitch. After more digging and prodding, Katie eventually got the name of the Canadian man, who was identified as Ronald Reed Purley a Canadian national in his 20s at the time. While an interesting story, investigators initially theorized that Everett had made it up, and they believed it was more likely that he had taken the 16-year-old into the woods somewhere, killed her, and left her behind. Detective Katie explained, quote, We know she was up on a potato farm up in Easton Center. The information we have is she was dropped off at a camp nearby. At this point, this is still a missing persons case. We don't have a clear indication of what happened to her. She may have gotten lost and died of exposure, or she might have been killed and left in the woods. End quote. However, they were able to get in contact with people who have only ever been identified as relatives of Pearlie's, and they confirmed the original story. According to them, Kathy had been in their home in September of 1971. Asked what had become of the young woman, they reportedly told authorities that a member of the family had harmed her, but they wouldn't give any additional information and refused to speak to detectives again. With them living on the reservation, neither the Portland police nor the RCMP had any jurisdiction to dig deeper or compel them to discuss the case. With the assistance of the U.S. Marshals Service, reservation authorities agreed to assist by finding potential witnesses to interview. However, they ran into a dead end when Ronald Reed Purley himself refused to discuss the case or anything about it. Not only did he deny knowledge of Everett, he claimed he'd never laid eyes on Kathy either. Their next hope 
was to track down Lester Everett, but unfortunately for detectives, time had already taken him off the board, as he died of cancer in 1986 at the age of 35. Local records indicate that Everett died on December 10th of that year in Yulee, Florida, and was buried two days later in Green Pine Cemetery. According to his obituary, Everett had permanently moved to Florida in 1971. Everett's previous main address was listed as being 47 Lincoln Street, six-tenths of a mile from Kathy's home and directly along her pathway from Starbird Music, three-tenths of a mile away. Everett being in Florida further confirmed statements from Millie Augustine, who noted that after the potato harvest, many of those who participated, including Everett, had driven south to Florida to harvest oranges. Apparently, Everett had explained to the group that he had some big plan and organized the orange harvest, but when they arrived in the state, they quickly learned that not only did Everett have no plans, he didn't know anyone who lived in Florida either. However, he allegedly drove south in the very 1963 blue Cadillac that Kathy had been taken north in. The stolen car was never recovered by law enforcement, though witnesses in the area claimed the old Cadillac had sat up on blocks in Everett's yard for years until it was eventually sold off for scrap. While detectives thought this might be a dead end, the end of Lester Everett's story, they actually came upon an interesting tale alleged to have occurred two years later in 1973. Reportedly, Lester learned that Kathy had never returned home and hadn't been seen since he dropped her off with Pearlie, and this bothered him perhaps because his wife was pregnant and with fatherhood looming on the horizon, he found himself thinking of the 16-year-old he'd abandoned years earlier. Investigators have confirmed that Everett got together with a friend, John Wayne Aceto, and together they traveled to North Maine. Crossing into New Brunswick, the two arrived at the Tobik Reservation and confronted Ronald Reed Purley. Reportedly, they asked where the girl was and what had happened to her, but rather than being given answers, they were violently beaten by several members of Pearlie's family. When the two men managed to get up, they were told, reportedly by Pearlie's brothers, that if they ever came back, they wouldn't leave the reservation alive. At that point, Everett returned to Florida and never discussed the situation with anyone, not with his wife, not with his son they never knew anything about Kathy Moulton. While they had run into a dead end when it came to Lester Everett, investigators believed they had uncovered enough information that the case was no longer cold, and they weren't planning on letting go. So, confronted by the fact that the only person they had left to dig into was Ronald Reed Purley, that's exactly what they did. They quickly learned that he'd been in trouble with the law multiple times in the past, and had actually been a person of interest in a still unsolved murder in 1978, seven years after Kathy had vanished. 23-year-old Julie Campbell was last seen alive just after 1 a.m. on the morning of Sunday, February 26, 1978, as she exited the Plow and Stars Bar at 912 Massachusetts Avenue in Cambridge. She had left with two friends, but had split off on her own to walk the less than half a mile from the bar to her home at 57 Ellery Street. Twelve minutes after leaving the bar, Cambridge police received a call about a woman screaming in the area of 25 Ellery Street. When officers arrived on the scene, they found Campbell bleeding profusely from her neck. Tragically, she passed away at 1.45 a.m. in the emergency room of Cambridge Hospital. An autopsy later showed Campbell had died as a result of massive hemorrhages resulting from four stab wounds. The weapon was believed to be a large hunting knife, and Campbell was stabbed in the neck, back, and chest. Reportedly, Hurley was detained and questioned at the time, but he was never charged with the murder. This is a case I will absolutely be digging into in a future episode, so maybe we'll uncover more links when I get to it. Police later spoke with a man identified only as Brent, who claimed that during a conversation with Pearlie, the latter had stated that he'd previously murdered a girl from Maine and buried her on some property, though whether or not that area has ever been searched is unknown. 
armed with all of the witness statements and evidence they could gather, an investigative grand jury was convened in Cumberland County in 1996. Hurley was the focus of the investigation, but the grand jury ultimately ruled there was not enough evidence to issue warrants or to even name Pearlie as a suspect. Despite this, Detective Katie and Sergeant Joyce found enough evidence for them to be convinced that Kathy Moulton died on the Tobik Reservation sometime prior to Thanksgiving 1971. They received multiple tips that her body was either buried in the basement of Pearlie's family home or in the woods near the intersection of two trails. Unfortunately, there is not enough evidence to obtain warrants or to conduct searches of these areas. Investigators tried again to get Pearlie to speak to them about Kathy, but he rejected all invitations. At one point, he was offered full immunity from prosecution, and all he had to do was provide investigators with details about what had happened so they might recover her body and bring her home. Even this extremely generous offer was rejected, and to date, Hurley has never spoken to law enforcement about what might have become of Kathy that November in 1971. Later that same year of 1996, Hurley was arrested, charged, and convicted of breaking into his neighbor's home and raping her. He had broken in through a window and was sentenced to serve eight to ten years in prison. To detectives, this only felt like more confirmation that Pearlie likely was directly involved in Kathy's murder, or at a minimum, had more information that could aid their investigation and was choosing not to share it. For the next few years, Katie and investigators continued to work the case, but everything they'd found, all the evidence they'd uncovered, really only led to one place, Ronald Reed Pearlie. Without something more powerful to compel him to speak, they knew they'd never find answers. More than 20 years after her disappearance, they managed to piece the timeline together. They found witnesses who could confirm that Lester Everett and Ronald Pearlie had picked up Kathy in the stolen 1963 blue Cadillac. They took her north, and Everett dropped Pearlie off across the Canadian border. He and Kathy worked on a potato farm for a few days until he handed her over to Pearlie, and from there, it appears she was kept against her will until Pearlie likely murdered her, burying her in a basement or possibly in the woods. With all of this information, in the summer of 1999, Detective Katie made the incredibly difficult decision to go to the Moulton house and to lay out everything he could prove and furthermore, what he and investigators believed happened to their beloved daughter. By then, it had been 28 years since they had seen their 16-year-old daughter who, by that time, should have been 44 years old. Katie laid out everything. He explained all the connections, discussed statements from witnesses, and expressed his heartfelt sorrow that Kathy had likely been the victim of a murder. Compounding complications was the realization that if Kathy had been killed in the lead-up to Thanksgiving in 1971, if an actual investigation had been done, they might have actually tracked her down before she was killed. How one accepts the reality that those charged with protecting and finding their daughter may very well have led to her murder by their disinterest in an action, I can't begin to fathom. The Moultons knew the police had failed them. They just didn't know to what extent. It was more difficult information to process, and at least for Kim, she felt angry knowing that something more could have been done and that maybe her sister might have still been alive. She explained, quote, More and more has been learned over the years that show that Kathy might have been able to be saved and found if different actions were taken in that moment. We went through our stages of feeling let down, disappointment, frustration, anger, sorrow, and then there's always the question, if any of us had pushed harder, if we had done more, would it have made a difference? End quote. Claire was quiet, as the detective spoke, not willing to acknowledge outwardly what she had felt for so long inside of herself, that the light of hope was fading away more with each passing year. For his part, Roy wasn't ready to accept the harshness of Katie's truth. Detective Katie explained, quote, The father didn't want to believe it. He said, 
I always want to keep my mind open. I'm going to hope you're wrong and she's going to show up and come through that door. End quote. The impact of Kathy's loss continued to resound through the entire family. Claire explained to Katie that starting from the day her daughter went missing and still, nearly three decades later, she would sit in the window every night, watching and waiting for Kathy to come walking up the driveway. Kim, Kathy's younger sister, confided that she had been afraid to have children for most of her life, believing she would never be able to handle it if one of her children went missing like her sister had. Kim later explained to the Portland Daily Sun, saying, quote, It was just so hard on our whole family. It imprinted us each with an individual, deeply emotional dose of reality. I was convinced for years that I would never have children, because after feeling how losing a child destroyed our casual comfort of family life when my sister disappeared, I thought I would never be willing to allow myself to be vulnerable to the worldly risks of potentially losing a child of my own. At age 25, I birthed our daughter, finally coming to terms with not living my life in fear of the worst. But I swear, when our daughter turned 16, it was the most difficult emotional year of her youth for all of us. Anytime our daughter was just 10 minutes late getting home, my emotions reeled, my heart raced, sank feared, mourned all over again for my sister, for what my parents must have felt when my sister never came home that night. End quote. Five years later, in 2004, law enforcement managed to track down the hunter who had come forward in 1983 with a story about seeing a young woman's skeleton in the woods of Smyrna, though this time they were wondering if perhaps the body could be Kathy's even though it didn't fit in with what investigators had learned of her likely murder at the reservation. Together, the Maine State Police and Maine Warden Service decided to conduct a massive search of the area in hopes of finding those remains. Even if they weren't Kathy's, that was someone's child, someone's sister, and they wanted to bring her home. The search was scheduled for late October, as they hoped the dying leaves might make the forest more manageable and a search somewhat easier. They set up a command post at the Brookside Inn and conducted searches by foot and by air, but even with the assistance of knowledgeable locals, they could not find the place where the hunter claimed to have seen the body. Kathy's sister, Kim, came up north for the search to represent the family and to hope against hope that something would finally be found. Unfortunately, the weather turned harsh and additional searches had to be delayed until later in November. When they were able to search, they utilized cadaver dogs, but they were never able to pick up anything to guide the search along. The weather continued getting worse, and all searches were called off. Sergeant Patrick Dorian of the Warden Service explained, quote, Unfortunately, the ground is frozen, so we're going to have to come back in the spring. We had to cancel our last attempt a few weeks ago because it snowed. End quote. The next year, in 2005, Detective Katie retired from the Portland Police Department and opened his own private investigation firm. He continues to work the case and has written an extensive and powerful novel about the case, entitled Kathy Moulton, Missing and Endangered, A Cold Case Missing Person Investigation. The last major piece of information in this case came to the surface in the spring of 2015, 44 years after Kathy's disappearance. On Friday, May 15th, investigators were contacted by a woman who stated that she recalled seeing Ronald Reed Purley dragging a sobbing young woman through the weeds near her home in the fall of 1971. The witness claimed that Purley dragged the young woman into the woods and later emerged alone. While this witness cannot confirm that the woman she saw was Kathy, law enforcement think there's a high probability that it was. This witness stated that years later, their dog returned from the woods with a human skull, which they described as small and possibly belonging to a teenager or child. At the time, they apparently didn't make the connection between this skull and the young woman dragged into the woods. Instead, they assumed the dog had retrieved the skull from a tribal burial ground, and so they later disposed of it in a communal dump from which it has never been recovered. 
Unfortunately, like so much of this case, it's another tantalizing lead with no possible way to find the truth unless someone is willing to speak up for Kathy, who can no longer speak up for herself. When last seen, Kathy Marie Moulton was described as being a 16-year-old white female with brown hair and blue eyes, standing 5 feet 4 inches tall and weighing approximately 98 pounds. She was last seen dressed in a navy short sleeve wool dress, a navy gabardine double-breasted box coat with brass buttons, and brown shoes. She was carrying her reversible leather Mexican handbag, two tubes of toothpaste, a pair of pantyhose, thread, and the key to her family's home. Kathy's eye teeth had been removed, and she wore braces, as well as thick eyeglasses with dark plastic frames. She has scars on both of her feet from wart removal, a white spot on her elbow, and flat moles scattered across her back. Her father last saw her walking south from Cumberland Avenue towards Congress Street in Portland, Maine. She is confirmed to have picked up her items and then stopped at Starbird Music at 525 Forest Avenue. There, she spoke with Carol Starbird before saying she was heading straight home and leaving at approximately 5.30 p.m. Following this, witnesses alleged to have seen her climbing into a blue four-door 1963 Cadillac driven by Lester Everett with Ronald Reed Purley as a passenger. It is believed she was taken north against her will was present at a potato harvest in the Mars Hill area and may have been taken into New Brunswick where she was left with Pearlie on the Tobik Reservation. Kathy was 16 years old when she vanished from the streets of Portland and if alive today, she would be turning 69 this June. Asked about his daughter so many years later, Roy Moulton confessed that his sincerest fear was to be left in the dark. He explained, quote, one of my greatest, greatest, greatest sadnesses is that I may die and never know what happened to Kathy, and yet I'm helpless to change it, end quote. Tragically, this horrible fate came true as Roy passed away in 2017 at the age of 92, never learning what became of Kathy, never being able to bring her home. Kathy's mother is today in her 90s and still hopes that one day her daughter will be found. But it is Kathy's sister, Kim, who has taken up the family cause, as the search for Kathy becomes a generational calling. More than 30 years after Kathy's disappearance, the Portland Press Herald sat down for an interview with the family. Roy carried most of the discussion, continuing to state that he was hopeful that someday they would find the truth. Noting the likelihood that Kathy was gone, that she would never be found, Roy was asked at what point you could consider giving up. He replied, quote, Do you still love her? Then don't stop. You have no reason at this point to think she doesn't love you too. I'll tell you something. I honestly don't believe there's been one day gone by that I haven't said a prayer for Kathy. It's human nature to hope. That's what love is. It's hope. This September will mark 53 years since Kathy Moulton disappeared from the streets of Portland. Despite their desperate pleas and calls for aid, the Moulton family were largely ignored by investigators and the Portland Police Department for decades. A real investigation, kicked off 24 years later, would reveal many startling details about what had likely happened to Kathy, where she had been taken, who had been involved, and the fact that she had probably been murdered. Now, we've seen cases where police didn't do much of anything, and decades later, new investigators are left to try and piece it together. Witnesses die, they forget, they move, evidence gets destroyed, suspects die. There's nothing simple or easy about working a cold case, and a lot of times, unless there's some DNA or a vital piece of evidence, the investigation will grow cold again. Yet, when Detective Katie dug into the case in 1995, he uncovered a wealth of information. He found witnesses who saw Kathy getting into the blue Cadillac. 
people who knew she left the area in the company of Lester Everett and Ronald Perley. They found witnesses up north who saw Katie at the potato harvest. They found witnesses in the Tobik Reservation who not only remembered Kathy, but stated she had been harmed by a member of their own family. All of the information gathered led detectives to believe that Kathy had been murdered sometime in the days leading up to Thanksgiving, two months after she disappeared. Essentially, it was learned that while no one can say with any certainty that Kathy would have been safely recovered if police had actually done, well, anything, it certainly seems like the chances were high. This 16-year-old was held against her will for months, subjected to who knows what and what kinds of horrors, and all the while the Portland Police Department were sitting on their asses acting like this was just a completely normal runaway situation. They didn't lift a finger to help the Moltons throughout the 1970s, and it wasn't until 1988 that any detective actually got out there and started asking questions and following leads. You know, Doing this podcast, so often I run into situations like this where we always pull out the old sayings. Well, you know, things were different back then. They just assumed runaway because most missing persons return home of their own volition. They had no reason to assume the worst and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter what the excuse is. I'm so fucking tired of it. If you're a police officer, and a family comes to you to report their daughter missing and your response is to laugh it off and give them a lecture, you're just a complete piece of garbage. You're not a human, you're a heartless scumbag, and you are everything wrong with law enforcement. I don't generally make broad statements about any groups of people or organizations. When I cover a case, I praise the police if they did a good job, and I challenge them if they did a poor job. What the hell do you say in a case like this where they just didn't do their job at all? I don't care about it being 1971. I'm so tired of this rose-colored retrospect through which we view the past, as if somehow there weren't horrible monsters, murderers, child molesters, abductors, rapists, and worst, roaming the streets back then. We act like the police didn't know better, that the world was such a kinder and gentler place, that how could we hold them responsible for being utter trash? Well, in 1971... They knew about the Boston Strangler, the Ypsilanti Ripper, Richard Speck, the Zodiac, and the Manson family, to name a few. Where the hell does this idea come from that police back in the 1970s were all working in Mayberry and nothing bad ever happened, so how could we possibly hold them responsible for not using their fucking brains? As far as I'm concerned, Kathy's likely death puts as much blood on the hands of those officers at the Portland Police Department as it does on potential suspects like Lester Everett and Ronald Perley. She likely died at the hands of one of those men, with most evidence pointing towards Perley. But it was the radical indifference and casual carelessness of the Portland Police that opened the door. I can't begin to imagine what it was like for her, alone and frightened, being held against her will and hoping against all hope that some super cop was going to kick the door down and rescue her. Hopefully, she didn't spend her last days and hours fully aware that the police didn't give a damn and hadn't tried to find her at all. It seems clear from the investigation in 95 that had they actually done the work, they could have found her. Normally, at this point in an episode, we dig down into all the different theories, but we can't really do that here. There aren't a bunch of different theories. There's not an endless amount of avenues we could explore. The investigative work done by Detective Katie does a fantastic job of laying out exactly what probably happened here. If you follow witness statements and evidence, you can pretty much track Kathy north, out of Portland, into the Mars Hill area, and eventually to the Tobik Reservation, from which she never returns. Not all of that can be proven beyond a reasonable doubt, which is the reason charges have never been brought but it certainly seems to fill in a lot of the gaps left by random theories that popped up over the years. You can get bogged down in the minutia of every different possibility from those who think Kathy went to Boston but could never produce any evidence to those who believe she was the victim of some burgeoning serial killer whose only evidence is that the serial killer was alive and within 500 miles, so surely he must have done it. It's like all these emails I constantly get about Israel Keys because apparently that guy was a super genius and killed everyone ever. Look, 
If the evidence is there, if a link can be established, then establish it and I'll follow you. But to claim that someone was killed by this person or that person because, well, they were in the area is just lazy and extremely disrespectful to the families of these victims. There are vastly more cases of people being killed with no connection to serial killers. But that isn't quite as tantalizing, so you've got to find a way to try and connect it. But I digress. I'm not going to spend time digging into all the possibilities because according to the detectives who actually worked this case, everything points to one place, one person, one likely crime scene, and I've seen no evidence to the contrary. Lester Everett was apparently involved in some kind of a predatory relationship with Kathy when he was 22 and she was 16. She gets into the car with him that day, and along with Pearlie, they're whisked 300 miles north. Now, we don't know if Kathy knew the plan when she got into the car that day, but it seems unlikely since she told everyone she couldn't wait to go to the big dance that night. She's seen at the potato harvest, unhappy and begging to go home. Everett drives off with her and returns alone, later claiming he dropped her at another camp and also that he left her with Pearlie. Family members of Pearlie's confirm this and say that a member of their family harmed her, but they won't say more than that. Can you imagine knowing that your relative murdered and likely sexually assaulted a 16-year-old and you're not going to speak up about it? Growing up around emotionless monsters like that, it's no wonder Pearlie turned out to be a piece of garbage. Now, I should note, law enforcement has never named either Pearlie or Everett as suspects in the case. There are certain rules that apply to what is necessary before you can name someone as a suspect, and we know that most of the investigation uncovered evidence from witness reports rather than anything physical. That being said, it sounds pretty damn convincing that Kathy was killed somewhere on the reservation prior to Thanksgiving of 1971. Pearlie, for his part, has a hell of a rap sheet, which includes breaking into his neighbor's home and forcibly raping her seven years after Kathy vanished. He was found guilty and had the audacity to try and get an appeal arguing that he shouldn't be held accountable because he didn't know the victim hadn't consented. Yeah, I'm not kidding. You can read through his appeal filings and it's as appalling as I imagine the scumbag is himself. So I imagine some of you are going to contact me and ask me why I chose to cover this case. It's hardly the first time I've been asked about why I cover a case where I often get the response that it's so obvious what happened. Well, that's a big part of why I do it. I don't cover unsolved cases to spin you an interesting yarn, to capture your imagination with a lot of different theories and stories and possibilities and sensationalism. I do it because the answers haven't been found. And while it might be easy to say, well, she was obviously killed, I don't think it's that easy for the family. Would you accept that if it were your sister or brother, mother or father? Would the suggestion of what probably happened suffice to answer all of your questions and set your heart and mind at peace? I know it wouldn't be enough for me. This isn't a case where the pursuit of justice remains at the forefront. There will unlikely ever be any justice here, and a killer will continue to live his life as he sees fit. A man who stole the future of not just a 16-year-old teenager, but those of her parents and her sisters. He robbed them of what might have been what the future could have held. And instead, he left them with the haunting trauma of loss and grief, something that can never be truly assuaged. Kathy's family managed to continue on to live their lives, but her loss radiated through their family and continues to reflect upon them today. It doesn't get any easier with the passage of time. Old wounds may heal, but they never fade away. Roy and Claire saw their daughter only through photographs, memories, and in the faces of their grandchildren. Roy went to his grave 46 years after his daughter was seen for the last time, and he never learned for certain what happened. Claire is in her 90s, and Kim is still carrying the banner of her sister's disappearance. They know they're not going to see an arrest, and they know that nothing they can ever do could bring Kathy back. What they want and what they need is to bring her home, to lay her to rest, to be able to confront that grief which has always haunted them but can never be fully realized without the body. Claire and Roy 
both made statements that it was the not knowing that was the hardest. No matter what you're faced with, you're never going to accept that your child is truly gone until it can be proven to you, and that just hasn't happened yet. Regardless of what detectives have uncovered, what facts and evidence they stand on, there are no words that can convince a mother or father to stop hoping for something oscillating between a hopeful fantasy and a flat-out miracle. However, the book isn't entirely closed either. There remain people who have information about Kathy's abduction, about her last days and hours, and about what happened to her. They know what the crime was, they know where she was taken, and they know where her body is likely concealed today. How they can live with themselves is a question I can't begin to answer because by keeping their mouths shut, they're protecting a child murderer. A man who had no qualms about murdering a 16-year-old girl who made the great offense of wanting to go home. He could have dropped her at a bus station or on a town corner where she could have walked to the local police and asked for help. No, instead, she had to be killed because fragile, weak people empower themselves by harming others. Lester Everett's was, by all accounts, a scumbag. He was 22 years old and manipulating a 16-year-old so that he could get what he wanted out of her, and I don't think we have to stretch our imaginations too far to know exactly what he wanted. Yet, two years later, he took a friend back into New Brunswick, went to the home of Ronald Purley, and demanded to know what happened to Kathy. He and his friend got their asses beat. They were threatened that if they ever came back, they'd be killed. And so Lester slunk back down to Florida and never said another word about Kathy. It certainly doesn't redeem him, but I'd say it puts him on a higher pedestal than anyone today who continues to keep information to themselves about this case. Those people are literal scum, lower than Everett and on the same level as the man who likely killed Kathy. By your silence, you allow this horror to continue and you play a first-hand role in the painful torture of the Moulton family that they have lived through for more than half a century. Detective Katie noted that every time there's coverage of this case, they get a few more calls, a few new tips or leads. We can only hope that by covering this case this week, that someone somewhere will pick up the phone and call the police. Hell, you don't even have to go that far. If you're such a coward, there are plenty of anonymous options. You can report tips to Crime Stoppers without giving your name or information. If you don't trust that, type a note, stick it in an envelope, and send it to the police. Create a new email address and send what you know to investigators, to the Portland police, the Maine State Police, the RCMP, or even tribal authorities. The knowledge you possess is a burden you will carry the rest of your life. So why continue? To protect a child killer? Because you're afraid of an elderly man? That just makes you as bad as him, except maybe a little worse, because it's by your own silence that he's allowed to one day do something like this again, or has he already? Kathy Marie Moulton vanished from the streets of Portland nearly 53 years ago and never made it home. Her father has gone to his grave without ever knowing the truth, and her mother is well into her 90s. Kim carries on the fight to bring her sister home, an older sister who is forever 16, younger than Kim's children, younger than the Moulton's grandchildren. The Moultons were able to share in Kathy's wonderful company for a mere 16 years, and now they have to confront their pain for more than 50 years. So many things are stolen by time. Memories of a voice, the sound of a laugh, the warmth of an embrace. With each passing year, more is stolen away by aging memories and the inevitability of time. Someone out there knows the truth. Someone has the ability to put an end to this horrible nightmare. And if they do not, if they choose to remain silent still, then the disappearance of Kathy Moulton will only remain open, unsolved, and growing cold again. If you're looking for more information about the disappearance of Kathy Moulton, 
there are many newspapers and websites discussing her case. For this episode, the Portland Press Herald and the Bangor Daily News were the most helpful. However, I would also highly recommend reading Detective Katie's book, Kathy Moulton, Missing and Endangered, A Cold Case Missing Persons Investigation. You can find that on Amazon as well as anywhere major books are sold. If you have any information about the disappearance of Kathy Moulton, please contact the Portland Police Department at 207-874-8479. She is case number 7160141. You can also leave a message on their anonymous tip line at 207-874-8575. You can also contact the Maine State Police at 207-624-7076. You can also text anonymously by sending PPDME plus your tip to tip411. That's send PPDME and your tip to 847-411. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, or comment in the Facebook group. Just a quick reminder, if you're planning to attend CrimeCon this year in Nashville from May 31st through June 2nd, use promo code TRACE at CrimeCon.com to save 10% on your pass. That's promo code TRACE at CrimeCon.com. Now, I'd like to take a moment to thank our amazing Patreon producers, without whom Trace Evidence would not be possible. A massive thank you to Andrew Guarino, Ann M. Bertram, Camelia Tyler, Christine Greco, Danny Renee, Denise Dingsdale, Desiree Laro, Donna Buttram, Diani Dyson, Jennifer Winkler, Justin Snyder, Kara Moreland, KY, Lars Jensen Fangel, Leslie B, Lisa Hobson, Madison Lahulier, Melissa Brekhuizen, Nick Mohar Schurz, Roberta Jansen, Ruth, Stacy Finnegan, Stephanie Joyner, Tom Radford, and Wend Organ. I want to thank you all so much for your support. It means the world to me, and you are truly the lifeblood of this podcast. If you're interested in supporting the show and listening to your episodes ad-free, please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence or click the support option on the official website at trace-evidence.com. This concludes our look into the 1971 disappearance of Kathy Moulton a truly heartbreaking case. But we know there are people out there with information, and at this point, we can only hope one of them finds some sense of decency and finally tells investigators what they need to know. No one needs to go to jail. They just want to bring Kathy home. Thank you all again for listening, and one last quick note, I'm going to be taking this week off, so I'll be back with episode 238 on Thursday, February 29th. Thank you all again, and I hope you'll join me two weeks from today for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.